Well, good morning, church. Oh, it's so good to see you. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1. And of course, if you need a Bible, raise your hand and we've got one for you to follow along. I am so excited to be with you today. And I'm so excited because we're in a brand new series studying the book of Acts. This series is called Authentic Church. As you know, our our mission statement is reaching and raising authentic followers of Jesus. How do we do that? Well, we would do well to look at the book of Acts to know just how to go about that because what we have here is the blueprint for the church, all right? You and I are the church. You and I are a spiritual house. We are a building made of souls, and we have an architect, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's given us this amazing blueprint. Somebody said that they thought it would be, it should be a requirement every five years for a church to, to go back and to study the book of Acts, to be reminded of our origin, to be reminded of our purpose, our mission, what we are here to do, how we began, and how we should go about the ministry. So I want you to stand with me right now. We are not going to read through this uh, all the way through the text as we customarily do before we begin, but we are going to pray. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon our time together. We ask a blessing on this reading of the word. We ask, Lord, that you would illuminate its pages to us and that we would be motivated. We would be inspired, oh God. And as we see the the inception of this mystery called the church, that we would see in it the very same mission that we have today, powered by the very same spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Sometime back, I heard a story about a rocky coastal land inhabited by a people who saw as their primary purpose the saving of lives. You see, offshore, out on the tumultuous seas, ships would come and go, and they would strike rocks, and many of them would capsize. And so the people from this community would row out in rowboats, and they would rescue as many crew members as they could, bring them back to shore, nurse them to health, and introduce them into their society. But between shipwrecks... This life-saving station had a lot of downtime. And so to occupy their minds, occupy their hands, they decided to refurbish their community. And they started building buildings. And they started to build a lot of fine, upscale restaurants. And they built, built a lot of social clubs. And they built a movie theater. And they built a performing arts center. And they built cafes and arcades and pool halls. And this place became quite uh, an enjoyable place to be. Not merely a life-saving station, but an entertainment hub. And it got to the point where the entertainment kind of took center stage and the saving of lives got to be a little bit of a nuisance, a distraction from their newfound passion in the pursuit of pleasure. And some of the folks who had been there at the very beginning, uh, who who had a problem with this new uh, direction that they were pursuing, they reminded them that this is not who we are. This is not what we were intended to be. We are a life-saving station. And so they all agreed to put in the lobbies of all of their new buildings sculptures of shipwrecks to remind them of why they were there. But those sculptures just ended up collecting dust. And they continued to forget what their purpose was. And so finally, the original members of the community split off, and they started their own life-saving station up the coast. And the old life-saving station just kind of gave up that enterprise altogether and full-time pursued pleasure and entertainment. But then the new life-saving station, well, they went through the same mess. They went through all the same distractions, and they got to the point where they split into two. And then that new life-saving station split into two. And that new life-saving station split into two. And so on and so forth to the point where today, if you go along that coast, you see all these buildings, architectural wonders, each with a sculpture of a shipwreck in the lobby to remind you of what they once stood for, but it's a culture of saving lives that they have long since abandoned. Well, they can, cl- they can throw a good party, but they have nothing to do with their original purpose of saving lives. Meanwhile, out on the ocean, ships continue to sink, and the voices of those in need of rescue fade beneath the waves. Kind of a sad story, but also an accurate picture of the church. Because the church was founded as a life-saving station. But over time, 
The church has become distracted by all these subsidiary things that we we have brought into our midst that are a part of our culture that are that are entertainment based and we've become obsessed with that and we've drifted from our primary purpose that we were founded upon where do we go to find our way where does a church look to find its way we look at the book of acts and this book that you have that you're looking at today if your bible doesn't have acts in it your bible loses all credibility Okay, very important book in your Bible, the book of Acts. First thing I want you to see in your notes is that the book of Acts validates the gospel. It validates the gospel. Without Acts, the gospels really don't amount to much because the gospels are prophetic of the book of Acts. In the gospels, Jesus says, I'm going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. When does that ascension take place? It takes place in Acts. He says to the disciples, I'm gonna give you a job to do. It's a job that I came to do and you're gonna do it now. When does that baton get passed off? It happens in the book of Acts. He says, I'm going to give you a spirit. I'm going to ask the Father, and he'll send it to you, and he'll be with you, and will be in you. When does the spirit come? It comes in the book of Acts. And so the gospels are predictive of Acts. Without Acts, the gospels are just this postulation of what could be, but it is the book of Acts that verifies that what the gospels talk about actually works. And so we look at Acts to get a validation for the gospel. In your notes, we also see that the book of Acts serves as the standard for the church. This is our standard. If you're going to be successful in life, you need a standard, right? If you cut wood, you got to use a standard. Uh, That very first piece of wood that you cut will be your standard. If you use the most recently cut piece of wood, eventually you're going to see that you're off by about a sixteenth of an inch every time. And you need to go back to the original And that's what we do when we look at Acts. In the book of Acts, we see the record of the constitutional fathers of the church. This is the way the church is supposed to look. It's simplistic. There's no budget. There's no building that they had. How in the world did they do ministry without a budget, without a building? I mean, they can't have concerts. They can't have comedians. They can't have events. They can't have big dinners and and, and guest artists and all this stuff. Now, none of that is bad. I love all of those things, but they are tools. They are tools to facilitate our purpose of the accomplishment of spreading the gospel. And when the tools become center stage, that is where you get into trouble. And so we are going to look at Acts 1 through 11 right here today to see the inception of the church. The church actually is founded in chapter 2, but we're going to see the root of it right here. And Luke, the writer of Acts, breaks down this uh, passage into sections. And we see them in verses 1 through 3. We're going to look at the way that he links the church to the Gospels. Luke links the church to the Gospels. Why are we here? Why is the church here? Why doesn't God just save us and baptize us and rapture us to glory? We've got a job to do. So we look in verse 1. Luke writes, in the first book, what book is he talking about? He's talking about the Gospel of Luke. All right? He wrote the Gospel of Luke. In the first book, O Theophilus. Now, who's that? Theophilus, trivia question, who in the Bible is more Scripture addressed to directly than any other person? It's this guy, Theophilus. Who was he? No idea. All right? But his name is Theophilus. His name means friend of God. Friend of God. And maybe Luke knew that the content of his writing would apply to all Christians across the ages. And if you know Jesus Christ, you are a friend of God. And this book may as well be addressed to you. He says, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. He's talking about the ascension of Christ. We're going to learn more about that at the end here. And then he says he was taken up after he had. And here in verse 2 and following, Luke is giving us the purpose of the church. After he had given commands. All right? The purpose of the church. Why are we here? It's tied to these commands that Jesus gave. Luke is pointing to the end of the Gospels to the command given. What command is that? It's written on the wall outside our worship center right now, and we call it the Great Commission. 
the Great Commission. In Matthew, uh, the Great Commission is go and make disciples. In Mark, it says go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. In Luke, he says proclaim to all the nations. In John, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And so Luke is pointing to that very important command at the end of the Gospels, and he begins his book of Acts by stressing the importance of that command. Why are we here in your notes? Two words, preach Christ. Preach Christ. Christ. Go and make disciples. That's what we're beginning with. This word command that Luke uses, it's from the Greek word entelo. The root there is telos, which means finish. Christ is saying finish these commands. There's an expectation of finishing it. Finish on the cross. He said to telestai, it is finished. He's giving us this instruction. He's not just saying, well, here's your orders. Good luck. No, there is an expectation that we finish the job, that we complete the task. Those of you who have kids, you tell them to do something, do you expect it to get done? Hey, man, I got four kids every night. Go to bed. Go to bed. What does that mean? In a very short amount of time, I expect teeth brushed, jammies on, lights out. How often does that happen? Hardly ever. And yet my expectation remains the same. I keep hoping. Uh, But when the church gets this objective right here, finish the job, preach Christ, when they understand that, it's a healthy church. It's a healthy church. When they know this prime directive and they stick to the main thing, man, it's an exciting place. The faith is fun. The faith is productive. Their Bible study is not an end to itself. Their fellowship is not an end to itself. It all serves this ultimate purpose of get the word out of the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, when a church doesn't get this, things go haywire. They get into weird doctrine. They fall off the deep end theologically. Uh, People who don't get this, Christians who don't get this main thing, they get selfish about church. They walk into church, they go, this is my church. This is my church. This is my worship service. I like my kind of worship. I don't like your kind of worship. I like my worship. That's my seat. See, I sit there every week. You don't sit there. It's my seat, right? And there's, there's a selfishness that pervades if you don't get this. This is why we are here, to share Christ, to have an outlet for our faith. You must have an outlet where the gospel is shared. If you don't, you're dead. You're dead. The Dead Sea in Israel, if you've ever been there, there's not a thing living in it. You know why? It has no outlet. The Jordan River trickles into it. The water sits there and stagnates. It's full of salt. Nothing can live in it. By comparison, the Sea of Galilee, sparkling full of life. Water flows in, water flows out. It's vibrant. That's how the Christian ought to be. That's why we're here, is to have an outlet for our faith. Now, that's why, but what what is the how? What is the how? How do we do this? How do we obey? He's going to tell us. After, uh, uh, before he ascended, he he gave commands in verse uh, uh, 2 there, through the Holy Spirit. That's how we obey, through the Holy Spirit. He gave commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. You're going to see the Holy Spirit referenced here about three times in this passage. Whenever you see something pop up multiple times in a passage, that means it's important. Okay, Don't lose sight of this. You need the Holy Spirit to do the commands. You cannot do what you've been asked to do without the Holy Spirit. You as a mere physical being cannot do it. Okay? The power is in the Spirit. If you could accomplish what we've been asked to do by building a building, done. Mission accomplished. This is a great building. I enjoy this building. If we could accomplish what we've been asked to do by meeting people's physical needs in the community, I believe we could do that. Heck, you don't have to be a Christian to do that. Plenty of good organizations out there that aren't Christian that meet people's physical needs. But here's the thing. Our primary directive is not to meet physical needs. Well, it's important, and we should do it as part of our identity in Christ. However, this task of, 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 of uh, accomplishing the gospel is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It involves penetrating hearts. It involves rebels against God turning and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It necessitates getting into a darkened heart and changing it. And you, as a mere physical being, cannot do that. You need the Holy Spirit working through you to do that. Jesus said, this is the way it works. A farmer casts a seed. He goes to sleep. He wakes up. The seed has sprouted. The farmer has no idea why or how. Why not? 
because there are bigger things than the farmer at work in the life of that seed, right? It goes in the soil. There's things going on in the soil, in the sunlight, in the air, in the precipitation, the water, and God is the one who grows the crop. The farmer has a very important, but very small job by comparison to the rest of the work. And so you need to be indwelled by the Spirit for the task to be completed, finished. And what is the content? When we say preach the gospel, what do we mean? What are we talking about here? Look in verse 3. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them. That means he would come and go miraculously. During 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Uh, What would happen here is Christ would continually appear and reappear to the disciples, offering them proofs of what? Of his literal death and resurrection. He's saying, guys, it's me. I did die. I was buried, but I'm back. See, it's really me. Thomas, come here. Look at my hands. Put your finger right there. You see that? That's a nail print. Put your hand right here. You see that? That's where the spear went in. It's me. I died. I was buried, but God raised me from the dead. These are facts that we are given to communicate, and they are literal facts. We have a, an historic time and space message. We are not to propagate a philosophy. We're not a philosophy. Christianity is not a creed. Christianity is not a religion. Did you know that? We're not a religion. You know what we are? We are an occurrence in time of what God did a supernatural God on behalf of man in the natural world. And he literally came down in the form of Jesus, lived a perfect life, was literally crucified on a Roman cross, was literally buried, and was literally raised from the dead. Those are the facts that we must promote as we accomplish the gospel. All right? And people put their faith in that. This is not just some philosophical message. Jesus was not just a good guy who believed according to a a moral code and and believed to the end and died a martyr's death, and we just kind of carry on his precepts in his memory. That's the liberal gospel. Our gospel is that he was the God-man who died as an atonement for sin, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. It's a supernatural message by a supernatural God, and that is why we are here That's the gospel. How do we do it? We don't. The Holy Spirit does through us. And the content is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Now, we've looked at the why. We've looked at the how. We've seen the content of that message. Now, we're going to look at the when. The when. When are we in the scope of things? When is this entity called the church in the grand scheme of history? I want you to look at verse 3. It says that he appeared to them. It says that he offered them proofs during 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. Speaking about the kingdom of God. That phrase, the kingdom of God, is a clue as to when we are in history. Okay? If I were to ask you, what is the kingdom of God? What would you say? Some of you might say, well, uh, I I think that's the church. That's that's Christianity. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are a part of the kingdom. Yes and no, all right? When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are submitting to be a subject in the kingdom that is to come. And you are part of a heavenly kingdom, but that kingdom is literally coming to the earth, and the church as you see it on the earth right now is not the kingdom, okay? You're not the kingdom presently, but you will be part of it eventually. You say, well, isn't this semantics? I mean, if we're, if we're not the kingdom, what are we right now? In your notes, when we are in history, we are in the age preceding the kingdom, okay? And we call it the age of grace. You and I live in what is called the age of grace, or we call it the church age. The kingdom is not yet. It is coming, okay? In verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? To Israel. That word Israel tells me God's got a purpose. God's got a plan that he has laid out, and there's something coming. Where are the disciples right now in this passage? They're on the Mount of Olives with Jesus, with the risen Lord Jesus. Now, this this is significant, that they are on the Mount of Olives with Christ. Because they're good Jewish boys, 
and they know their Bible. And they remember the words of the prophet Zechariah who said that one day the Messiah is going to come back. He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. And half of it's going to move south and half of it's going to move north. And he is going to proceed from there. He's going to judge the earth and he's going to establish his kingdom. Okay? So they have this in mind. And here they are on the Mount of Olives with the risen Lord. And they're thinking, is this it? Is this it? Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen now? Did it happen? Did he establish his kingdom right then and there? No, he did not. And what that tells me is we, as the church, are not the end of God's dealings in history. We're not the end of God's dealings, okay? He's got something else coming. And so we look at the text to find out what that is. And what we have is there is the resurrection of Christ, and there is the second coming of Christ, and in between right here is a gap. There's a gap right here. You and I live in that gap. We live in the church age. It's the age of grace. You know why it's called that? Because this is the age in which grace is extended to the world. And if people respond to the grace that we preach as as Christians, then they sign up to be subjects in the kingdom that is coming. This is the age of enlistment for the kingdom. You got it? That's where we are right now. Jesus said it this way. He told the disciples in the Gospels, he says, do you not have a a, a saying four months until the harvest? There was a Jewish expression, four months and then the harvest. That means we we got time. And Jesus said, behold, the fields are white. The fields are white. What does that mean, the fields are white? It means time to harvest. When the fields are white, you get out there and you harvest that grain. And you get it in the barn. If you don't work around the clock and get it in the barn, it's going to rot. It's not going to be any good. It's going to be too late. And we live in a finite age where grace is offered for a time. But there will be a time that comes when it will no longer be offered. And so the, the sense here is urgency. Jesus is leaving, and as he's leaving, he's saying, preach, because I'm coming back. And when I come back, it's going to be too late. Get her done. Finish the job. That is our tie to the gospel. This next section, it moves into the connection between the church and the Old Testament, and we're going to look at who we are as a people. Look at verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart, from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Now, this is very important. When Jesus was in the upper room of the disciples, he made a promise to them. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I'm going to ask the Father. He will send you another who is just like me. The Holy Spirit is going to be with you, going to be in you, right? Now he takes them back further than that upper room. He says, this is the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. That means that promise of the Holy Spirit was given before by God himself, God the Father. To who? To Israel. When? Way back in the Old Testament. In Joel, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, he made a promise. What was the promise? It was the promise that in the kingdom that we're talking about, Israel would receive the fullness of the Spirit on their sons, Their daughters, their male and female servants, all who name the name of Christ will be saved. And God would write his law on their hearts, and he will be their God. They will be his people, and they will be a new creation. So who we are as a people, in your notes, we are partakers of something promised first to Israel. Jesus got those guys in the upper room in the gospel. He said, what the Father's promised to Israel, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. And then they spread it, and if they hadn't spread it, we wouldn't have it. But now we have the promise. We are brought into this. Isn't that a blessing? Aren't you glad that that promise didn't just stay in Israel, that it was extended to the rest of us? We are partakers of that promise. And he says, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. What are they waiting for? What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the power. He knows if they leave town on their own power, they're going to shoot their mouth off and they're going to get into trouble. They better wait because Peter and company are a rather overconfident bunch. 
Okay, you ever move hastily in your overconfidence? I have more times than I care to admit. When I was in college, I uh, I had an opportunity to sing a solo in our chapel service, large Christian school, thousands of students. It was a demanding song. I pulled it off. There's some big notes. I was a little nervous, but I did it. And I got a lot of good feedback. A lot of students came up. Hey, man, that was awesome. Professors, son, you did a great job. And Scott's head got a little inflated. I, I got a little full of myself. I was walking around campus thinking I'm all that in a bag of chips. All right? And I, I got a newfound confidence, got a little ego boost, and I'm thinking I'm all that. I walk into the cafeteria. I get some food. I got my tray. I walk into the seating area, and I'm looking around. I'm thinking, all right, the party's here. Whose table shall I bless, right? And I look, and I see there's a young lady sitting right here, and this girl I, I, I kind of had a crush on, okay? But I, I was not really much of a ladies' man, so I, I'd always been very nervous to approach her one-on-one. -on -one. Well, no longer. My time had come. And so in my newfound confidence in myself, I walk up confidently with my tray, and I look at her, and I say, excuse me. Is this seat taken? And she looks at me and she says, Why, well, no, it's not, Scotty Potty. Now, she could not have known this. She was being flirtatious, but that name, Scotty Potty, is from my childhood. And like most of you, you all probably had a nickname that you hated when you were in school. That was mine. And when she said Scotty Potty, I got a flashback to second grade recess. And I could hear the echoes of those elementary school students saying that name. And it flustered me and it threw me off my game. And I got nervous. I started to sweat. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, has, has anyone ever called you Scotty Potty before? And I'm thinking, how could she know? How could she know who she talked to? You know, and I'm trying to be cool, just, you know, get through the moment, man. And I'm, I just kind of laugh nervously. And I'm like, <laughs> Are you kidding, man? I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody called me Scotty Potty. Except I was so nervous, I got tongue-tied. And instead of nickel, I said nipple. Let me tell you something. You don't recover from that. There's this long, awkward pause between us. I just looked at her. She looked at me. I said, I just said nipple, didn't I? She said, yeah, you did. I said, okay. And I walked away. Folks, that's called a crash and burn, all right? When you are overconfident only in yourself, that can happen. And in the Christian life, if you go out to do ministry and you've not prayed up and your trust is not in the Lord Jesus and your trust is in yourself, you are going to fail. If not, you're going to have to redefine success. And so we need to understand we are partakers of something promised first to Israel, but we need to learn from their example because Israel got uh, uh, their head full. They started to think they were all that, and they did not take seriously the command in Psalm 67, which explains the purpose of blessing is to be an example so that the world, the nations will be glad, and they will, they will turn, and they will worship your God. And so in your notes... We're not just recipients, but stewards of blessing. We're stewards of blessing. We take it seriously. Now we see a section here from 6 on uh, about the church and the kingdom. We see where we are heading. Verse 6 says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, they're on the Mount of Olives. They know what Zechariah said about Messiah coming down, splitting that mountain in two laying waste to his enemies, establishing his kingdom. Now, when they say, will you at this time establish the kingdom? Are they talking about a literal kingdom? Is that their expectation? You better believe it. Now, does Jesus deny that it is a literal kingdom? No, he does not. He doesn't deny it. What does he say? He says, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The implication here is that this is, in your notes, the kingdom is a literal future event. It's coming. 
but we don't know when it's coming. We don't know when it's coming. All right? He says, I'm not going to tell you. Times or seasons. The Bible is filled with times and seasons of God's working out of his plan in mankind. There was the time of creation. There was the time of the fall. There was the time uh, of the flood. There was the time of the patriarchs. There was the time of the church age that we are now in. It is a finite time, but it will come to an end, but it's not for us to know when it ends. Paul told the Athenians in Acts 17, he said, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people to repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. There's a judgment coming. When Jesus comes back, he will judge the world. There's a a thing we don't know in your notes. It's the time of judgment. But there will be a judgment not for you to know times or seasons does Jesus know when he's coming back Mark 13 32 Jesus says but concerning that day or hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father only the father there's something we don't know but there's something we do know at least in part we know the will of God We know the will of God. People really struggle with the will of God. I work with young adults. This is numero uno for them. What is God's will? And then those three important uh, words, for my life. You ever ever wanted to know that? What is God's will for my life? Okay, best advice I ever got as a young person, don't worry about God's will for your life. Just worry about God's will. Because the Bible doesn't really talk about knowing God's will. It talks about doing God's will. And his will is revealed in Scripture. It is his will that you be sanctified. If you're not saved, you're out of the will of God. Pretty basic. It is his will that you be thankful. It is his will that you worship him. And at least as far as Acts 1 is concerned, it is his will that you be his witness. Verse 8, he says, but you will receive Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I love this language, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. It reminds me of Gideon and how the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, it says, clothed himself with Gideon. What cool language. Let the Holy Spirit clothe himself with you. Let him just put you on like a garment and you move forward, and and the Lord will open doors for you and hearts as you share the gospel. Some of you cannot even imagine sharing your faith with people. It scares the dickens out of you. Ask God to fill you with his spirit and give it a shot and see what happens. You might be surprised. And, and what have you got to lose anyway? What are you, are you afraid you're going to scare people into hell? They're going there anyway. Throw them a line. Let the spirit clothe you and throw them a line. Share the, now, you may not see them respond. You may not be privy to how that turns out. God's timing and the other people who influence lives has an effect. My prayer is that we all walk into heaven one day and we're mobbed by people who come up to us because we've been faithful in life to share. And they say, I am here because of what God did through you in my life. Thank you. There's people I'm going to say that to, I'll tell you that. And so he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's saying, start here and where you are in Jerusalem and then go on to Judea and then go on up through Samaria and just keep on going north till you hit Sacramento and over to San Francisco. Right? That's what it says in the Greek right there. That's the ends of the earth, right? This is a worldwide outreach. And then after they get all this in verse 9, When he'd said all these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. I want you to know this really happened. He really went up. This is not metaphorical. He didn't just walk off and he was just, well, he was lifted up in their hearts. No, he went up. He was a literal man who was literally killed, who literally rose, and now he literally ascended to the right hand of the Father, and they watched him go. Can you imagine watching that happen? He disappears in a cloud. And and then in verse 10, while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by in white robes. I believe these are angels. Maybe the ones from the tomb. Who knows? And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? 
This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Zechariah's words will be fulfilled as Jesus will return to the very spot from whence he lifted off on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to split it in half. And he's going to move forward and establish his kingdom. He's coming back. And this ascension, this is one of the most undertaught concepts in all Christology, and I do not want to miss it. And I don't want you to miss it because there are three important things I'm going to leave you with. Three things his ascension means for the church. Number one, it's our security. It's our security. What do I mean by that? My sin was punished in Christ on the cross. My victory over sin was accomplished through his resurrection, but my security My certainty, my knowledge of where I will spend eternity is found in the fact that he ascended and is now at the right hand of the Father because if he is in the presence of the Father and I am in Christ, as the Scripture says, then he is holding my spot. He is reserving a place for me. And what's he doing there? Paul wrote in Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn Christ Jesus, the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. What's he doing at the right hand? He's interceding. He is pleading with the Father on our behalf for our acceptance to bear us up as with wings like eagles. And because of that fact, Christian, you can have every confidence, even when you are on your deathbed, in your waning moments on this earth, you can die well because you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt if you put your faith in Christ, you will spend eternity with Jesus forever. Amen? He's our security. He's also, in your notes, our power. There is great power. Uh, he is seated, seated at the right hand. Listen, to be at the right hand of God is a statement. To be the right hand man means That God can say, make it so, and it gets done. He told the son, my will is that you go down there, you live a perfect life, and you are crucified in their place, and you rise from the dead. Jesus did it. And one day he's going to say, son, it's time. Go back, judge the earth, establish your everlasting kingdom, and it will happen. It will be done. That means that Christ has all power and all authority from the Father, and when you pray to him, you can have all confidence that he can answer your prayer without a doubt. The only limit on your prayer is the will and the timing of God. But we can have confidence. And then lastly, and I love this, his ascension represents hope. It represents hope. You know what that hope is? That he went up, but he's coming back. He may be at the right hand of God now, but he's not going to stay there. He may have ascended in a cloud, but he is coming back in the clouds. He may be gone from our sight, but one day he's going to split the eastern sky and every eye will see him and he is going to return and he's going to fulfill his promises. Do you believe that today? Come on now. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus is coming back? Do you really believe that he is coming back? Do you live like you believe he's coming back? Because that knowledge, that faith that you have, if you believe he is who he said he is, if you believe that he will do what he said he will do, then you know that the time is short. Your claim in glory should give you confidence in your life to live according to your identity, but your knowledge of the finite nature in which we, of the time in which we live means that sand is running out of that hourglass for that lost world clock is ticking. We live in an age of grace. And you must, in your notes, let your future define your present. May your activity on this earth be defined by what you know is coming. Live according to the blueprint that God gave, the mystery called the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being called your church. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in here today who has yet to put their faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that they will do so. God, as our prayer team makes their way toward the front, 
I, I, Lord, I just ask that you would move in the hearts of those who have not received you and that they would make a decision where they are and that they would come forward and that they would meet with someone up here at the front. Our prayer team would pray for them, Father God, and that they would trust Christ. God, I pray for the rest of us that we would live out our identity with boldness, with confidence, aware of your plan, what you have revealed thus far. And we give you all the glory, your people, your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.